Verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. There's order here. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The Word of God always sets this order. Knowledge precedes application. You cannot live what you do not know. Knowledge of God's Word always precedes His will. Even in Matthew 7.24, when Jesus talks about wisdom, He said, The man who hears My words and does them shall be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the, on the rock. And this same truth applies here, where Christ sets forth, where He says, If you know these things, and it's not just simply the knowing, it's the knowing and the doing. And I have heard Christians who have heard the words of this passage utter an amen, but would not lift a finger to do the things that Christ has called them to do. And they do not know the blessing. Because both are necessary. If you know these things, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So both are necessary. A few summary points. The central idea of the text, very simply, is that Jesus provided an object lesson for the disciples that demonstrated humility in service to others. Pretty straightforward. I mean, there are some difficult passages that I can study and wrap my brain around and really wrestle with, but this one's pretty straightforward. I like that. Point number two, laying aside his garments and putting on the garments of a humble household slave was analogous to his coming into the world as the eternal Son of God and taking upon Himself humanity, it was a condescension of love that He would come into this world and take upon Himself humanity. Of course, in the high priestly prayer in John 17, He talks about taking back. He talks about going back to heaven and to that glory that He shared with the Father before He came into the world. Point number three, Jesus' object lesson included washing dirty, washing the dirt from the disciples' feet. Foot washing in John 13 is analogous to 1 John 1, 9, where the believer confesses his sin to God for forgiveness and restoration of fellowship. You see, just as people would walk through the streets of Jerusalem and collect dust on their feet, so we walk through the devil's world as Christians and we commit sin. It doesn't destroy our salvation. We are bathed. We are clean. We are in Christ Jesus. But we do sin. And that hurts our fellowship, does it not? But thank God for 1 John 1, 9. That if we confess our sins, that He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Point number four, Jesus was under great pressure knowing that He was about to be betrayed and suffer crucifixion. Yet he kept focus and demonstrated love, humility, clear teaching, prayer, and submission to God for his final hours up to the cross. And the more that I read through those chapters, the more I just marveled at the concentration that Christ must have had in that upper room. That he was not distracted. That he was not distracted. That he could keep focus on the teaching and on everything that he said. I mean, I just can't imagine if I was facing my death tomorrow and the kind of death he faced, I'd be a wreck. I say that. But he had great concentration. And you know what's interesting? Is in the first 12 chapters... The primary words that are used by Christ throughout His public ministry are truth and light. 
In John chapter 13 through 16, it's the word love. It appears 31 times in those chapters. And that says something about his mental attitude. He was thinking of love toward his disciples. That's great. That's powerful. It shows where his mind was. That he would say that word so many times to them. Again, I just, I, I just, I'm so amazed at that. Point number five, as a servant, Jesus came to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45, it says, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came into the world as a servant. And to die and to give his life a ransom for many. Kind of says it all, doesn't it? For Christians, greatness is not measured by the service others provide to us, but by the service we provide to others. And I think when it comes to being a Christian, self-sacrifice, what we can give for the cause of Christ what we can give self-sacrificially for the benefit of others, thinking more of others than we think of ourselves. And by the way, thinking more of others isn't necessarily having a sense of worthlessness as much as it is a sense of unworthiness about ourselves toward Christ. You know what I mean? Because we have a high position in Christ. I mean, we are children of God. We are royal ambassadors. We are brothers and sisters to the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's not that we have a low position. We have a high position. But that doesn't remove from us the responsibility of service or sacrifice or commitment that we have to give of ourselves to others. Right? Christ is our role model. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, we have captured this evening just a small section of your revelation within the larger context of Christ's life and the world in which he lived. And there was great political turmoil. And he was at a point in his life when there were many who had rejected him and wanted to see him dead at any price. But Father, in spite of the great pressure that was in front of him, Father, he kept his focus. And in humility, he humbled himself to your will and continued to Submit himself to your plan, Father, to go to the cross and to show love to the disciples in his service to them, by his teaching them, and ultimately dying on their behalf. And Father, we are so thankful that this event has been recorded for our benefit, that we can read these things, Father, and that we can look to Christ as our role model, Father. And that we can understand his sacrifice and that we can have a model for ourselves, Father, when it comes to living self-sacrificially. Father, we thank you so much for Christ who died in our place. We know that the scripture is very clear when it says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. John 20, 31, which says these things have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. In Acts 4, 12, which says, for there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. And Father, we know that when Paul found himself in the Philippian jail, 
And the jailer asked him that most simple question, what must I do to be saved? Paul gave that simple answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Father, we know that believing in Christ means that we trust Him to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves, to save us. For if we could save ourselves, then Christ would have never had to have come and died. And His death is a testimony of the fact of this thing which we cannot do. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And to believe in Christ is eternal life, and not to believe is eternal condemnation. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have eternal life. We pray now as we go forth, Father, that we will be challenged by the things that we've studied, that we might grow thereby. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. What a blessing. What a blessing. And we, uh, I was thinking about last week as the, uh, the emails were going out to all of the pastors and all of the student teachers, and we were explaining the uh, evaluation process. Uh, each of the students that have been speaking this week at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, each of them has been critiqued and evaluated and, and by the pastors that are here, the visiting pastors. And, and uh, as the explanation was going out, there, there came to be some emails back and forth amongst the pastors expressing some trepidation and, and uh, are, are we going to be evaluated too? <laughs> and uh, I tell you, we were tonight uh, top marks all the way down, top to bottom, and I appreciate that very much. We were very blessed to have this wealth of teaching here this last week. We thank you. Well, folks, uh, we are on break. Uh, we will return at the top of the hour at 8 o'clock for our second session tonight. Uh, Pastor Todd Kennedy will be closing us out here this evening. Uh, you're on break. Thank you.